Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us on the final afternoon session of the South Dakota Local Foods Conference. This session is going to be on um, backyard chicken keeping with Stephanie Peterson, the owner and operator of Fruit of the Coop. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Stephanie before she gets started. So Stephanie is from Northwest South Dakota originally. Um, Lemon, is that right, Stephanie? Yep. Yep. And uh, she had been out in DC for about 10 years working in Senator Daschle's office. But she moved back in 2014 and uh, lives on a seven acre farm uh, outside of Brandon um, with her husband and her two sons. And she operates a wholesale egg business, Fruit of the Coop which she grew from just 16 hens into a flock of 100, which is pretty impressive. Um, and in addition, in addition to her own eggs uh, from her flock, she sources pasture-raised eggs from other small flocks around the region and then sells those to Sioux Falls area restaurants. She is also a very active board member with Dakota Rural Action. Um, and she works on a variety of local foods uh, policy initiatives, both statewide and around the country. So with that, I will uh, send it over to Stephanie and please let us know if you have any questions, throw them in the chat and we'll answer those as they come up. Okay, great. Um, hi everybody, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hop up and down a few times here, but um, Welcome, and I'm glad you guys could make it uh, for this talk on chickens. Um, I love chickens, I'm obsessed with chickens, and I could talk about chickens all afternoon, so it's a good thing they limited my uh, speaking uh, engagement to two o'clock today. <laughs> um, so I, I, we sent out that survey. I was interested to know, um, for the folks that are, that are tuned in today, um, you know, who's, who's looking for information on how to set up their own backyard chicken keeping um, just for their own, you know, fun and uh, food for their family um, versus like someone who maybe wants to get into the production side of things and actually have a business where they're selling eggs. Um, and it looks like from the survey, the majority is consumers interested maybe in having your own chickens or just kind of interested in the process. Um, so, so I'm going to kind of hit this from the angle of um, setting up your own backyard chicken um, operation for your for yourself, um, a little more personal. Um, and if there's any questions about like taking it to the next step, how to sell the eggs, um, you know, the, you know, anything about that record keeping, marketing, production, um, licensing in the state, um, you know, setting up an LLC, you know, I'm happy to answer those questions in the chat or, you know, offline or even here if we have time. So um, just got to, I keep getting these things popping up here. Okay, so I am going to start out. Um, uh, thank you, Jordan, for the introduction. That was, that was pretty good. Um, you, you hit all the, the main points, I think. And um, like uh, he said, I, you know, I'm on a seven acre farm. Um, we're trying to maximize our space here. And um, I really, uh, in order to meet the demand of the egg sales that I'm currently doing, I probably would need around 400 birds. Um, I usually, in a non-pandemic setting, I'm usually selling about 100 dozen eggs a week. Um, with the restaurants closing down, that has shifted things quite a bit. Um, I've gone into more consumer sales, um, direct to consumer by the dozen, which is not my preference, but um, you know, it's something I had to do during the pandemic to, to get the inventory off the shelf. Um, but uh, I did not want to have 400 birds on my seven acres. Uh, I don't think that would really work out too well. So, um, you know, came up with the model of, of, you know, finding other local producers in the area who maybe have 50 to 100 birds and have obviously an excess of eggs. Um, and so I kind of swoop in on those people and, um, you know, thoroughly vet them and meet them and meet their birds, see their operation, see how they're raising them, what they're feeding them. Um, I usually then will we'll bring some eggs home and I will taste test them. My family will have to taste test them. We, you know, we, we look for uh, not only the way the egg tastes, but also um, the, the quality of the egg itself, um, how it appears in the pan, the consistency of the yolk, the color of the yolk, the consistency of the white. Um, there's so many things involved in an egg and in, in a good egg versus um, what I refer to as a factory egg um, that would come off your grocery store shelf. 
Um, so yeah, I could have a whole talk probably on just the eggs themselves, but uh, we'll, we'll back away from that. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so Jordan told you what we got going on here. We also have a couple of horses. We have a lot of uh, dogs, cats, you know, a lot of stuff going on. Um, I have about uh, right now three chicken coops going. Um, I kind of have uh, one main flock, which I call the house flock, which is about 50 birds that is up near the house. And they're in two, uh, two coops and they share a run and then they, they free range on the property during the day. Um, and then last year, I we built a mobile chicken coop that is basically, um, it was an old greenhouse made out of cattle panels that we purchased and um, used from someone. And we put it up on a flatbed trailer that we could haul with our ATV. So um, the purpose of that being that I, I really wanted to focus more on like a really serious production flock in that coop. So, you know, I ended up with 50 birds out on the pasture, um, separate from my house flock. Um, and, you know, my house flock, I've treated more, uh, started treating them as pets originally. Um, they've grown beyond that, of course, now. But um, I also have some older birds in that house flock that kind of age in place here, maybe don't produce as many eggs, um, but they still get to stick around. Um, and then that production flock out in the pasture is really more serious. Like when they're done laying eggs, you know, they're going into the soup pot and we're going to move on and, and, and rebuild the flock um, every year or two. So, and, and I did do just that this spring. We actually had to move that um, coop wagon. Um, this summer, we had to move that coop wagon up a little closer to the house. I had a lot of predator problems having them deep down in the pasture. Um, so I, I kind of anticipated that could happen. Um, so we did move them up closer to the house and I, I refurbished with a whole new flock um, this fall in that coop um, that, were, that are just starting to lay now. Um, and so we'll see, hopefully I won't have um, as many fox and raccoons um, coming this up, this close up to the house. But that's also something we'll talk about is how to predator proof your setup and um, your backyard chicken setup. So I'm gonna share my screen um, and just get started with the presentation here. And like I said, just, um, and Jordan, just interrupt me. I'm not really reading the chat. So if there's a question that comes up, I'm happy to be interrupted during um, the presentation to answer it. We don't have to wait till the end. Sounds good. We did have a really quick question about just where to get your eggs and Matthew threw up your website. Is that the best way to get a hold of you? Yeah, so um, so getting my eggs, like I said, I, I primarily am a, a selling in bulk to restaurants. That's my, my primary mode. Um, during the summer months of May through October, you can purchase my eggs by the dozen at Cherry Rock Farms, which is just south of Brandon on Highway 11. They have a farm stand that's open six days a week and I keep a refrigerator stocked there. So that would be a summer option. Um, all year round, I sell my eggs by the dozen at a small grocery store in Sioux Falls called The Root Cellar. And that is um, down across from the Levitt Music um, Auditorium, Outdoor Amphitheater and Falls Park. And it's in the, the brand new Cascade building, which has retail on the first floor and apartments and, and condos on the top. Um, so you can buy them by the dozen there. I do sell them by the dozen on my website. Uh, you can order and pay um, that way. Um, if, if we do it that way, you then just need to text me, which my number is on there, and arrange for either pickup here at the farm or, um, you know, I'm going into Sioux Falls frequently and if it's convenient, can meet you somewhere to drop them off. But um, yeah, so right now that's kind of how, how we do the by the dozen. Uh, so yeah, and I'll probably always have some little by the dozen available here and there um, in, in different ways. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, I was selling by the dozen at a liquor store, which was interesting. <laughs> I've never <laughs> sold at a liquor store before, but you know, it was strange times. Um, and then one other thing is, I don't know if you all have heard, if you've been tuning in the last couple of days, one of the pres presenters was Anna Anderson from Glory Garden. She also will have my eggs available on her website. Um, and she opens up her website um, for sales. I think it's open now. And she does a monthly order. So you have to, you only have about three days during the month when you can place your order. And then she has seven or eight drop sites. Um, her first one is coming up next Tuesday uh, afternoon. So you would place your order for vegetables, um, you know, eggs, whatever, pay for it online, choose your drop site. And then next Tuesday you would go and have basically a no contact pickup um, at the drop site of the of the items you purchased. So that's another way, and then that'll last through the whole winter. So that's a way to order my eggs once a month through the winter, um, which is pretty convenient. So, yeah. All right, any other questions before I hop in, Jordan? We're good? Nope. Okay, great. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Here is uh, the presentation that um, we're gonna kind of quickly go through. Um, I'm just gonna kind of fly through this. Um, 
And uh, obviously, if there's um, questions, just jump in. Um, let me see here if I can get this going. Okay, we already kind of talked about who we are here and who's in the coop and my family, my two teenage boys, dogs, cats. Um, I do also uh, have goats. In the summer months, I rent goats from a goat farmer in Minnesota um, from May through October. And I use the goats as a tool on my property. Um, I rotate them around the pastures to eat all the invasive weeds and the invasive brush. Um, we don't use any chemicals here and we are right in the watershed of the Big Sioux River with two creeks running on our property that run directly into the river. So we try to keep that water as clean as possible. Um, so yeah, the goats are a fun addition to the farm in the summer. Um, they are a lot of work. We use electric netting to do intensive rotational grazing um, around, around the pastures. Um, so, and I, and I love talking about them and showing them off. So if, if anybody ever wants to come out for a visit next summer while I have the goats, they're super fun to, to learn about. Um, all right, so we'll move right along here. Um, why chickens? Why have chickens, right? Um, so many reasons. Um, they're called the gateway drug into, into uh, livestock animals. <laughs> and I think that's probably true because um, I started with chickens and now, you know, horses and goats and who knows, I've had sheep, who knows what else we'll have out here. Um, but they're great for a backyard setup. They're, they're small. Um, they don't make a lot of noise. They don't require walking like a dog would. Um, they can benefit your yard in a variety of ways. They can aerate the grass, um, fertilize the grass for you. Um, and one of the most important reasons, of course, to have them is because they make food for you. Um, and a farm fresh uh, egg out of one of your chickens is uh, a pretty thrilling. And especially if you have little kids, it's really exciting for them to learn where their food's coming from, um, to be able to go out and collect the eggs each morning. Um, a warm egg under a warm hen is kind of exciting. Um, so yeah, they're, they're just really fun and they're entertaining. All the different breeds have different personalities and temperaments, um, which are dictated by their breed. Um, so you can, you can spend a lot of time online at hatchery websites looking through the different breeds and reading all about their personalities and um, seeing how beautiful they all are and choosing that way, which is really fun. Um, they're generally an inexpensive pet um, to buy. They're, you know, three or four dollars as a chick. Um, you know, a full grown chicken might run you anywhere from 10 to 20 dollars. Um, and uh, a live one, <laughs> let me just clarify that. Um, and, uh, but, you know, so the biggest setup with chickens is basically um, the, the coop. You know, you're setting up your coop, uh, purchasing or building a coop. That's going to be your biggest cost at the beginning. Um, you know, any fencing you might need. Um, once that is done and out of the way, just the general day-to-day -day care of a chicken is very inexpensive. The feed is not terribly outrageous. Um, you know, they they do a lot of benefits for you. They also will eat all your kitchen compost. So if you wanted to compost but you weren't sure how to start with a compost. Um, uh, pile and maybe you didn't want a compost pile. These guys are basically a living compost pile and they will eat all your scraps and turn them into eggs for you. So um, that's really rewarding as well. Um, where to buy your, your chickens? Um, a variety of options for you there. If you want to get chicks um, that you can go online and order them from hatcheries around the country and have them sent to you overnight as one day old chicks. Um, super exciting and fun. Um, you can also buy them from local breeders. Um, which uh, you can actually find a lot of local breeders on Facebook. And there's two specific Facebook pages that I use regularly. One is called South Dakota Poultry Exchange. And they are, and I'm sure Jordan will throw this in the chat. Um, they are a statewide uh, Facebook group full of poultry owners from small scale to large scale. Um, um, and not not factory large, but you know, uh, a hobbyist more or production like I am. Um, and, and they also do have a lot of breeders on there. So if you want a specific breed, you can do that, go that route. That's also where you can buy the, the older birds that are already laying, which is kind of nice. Um, you can, um, there's another, uh, one other Facebook group that I go to, which is Sioux Falls Chicken Tenders. That's more local to the Sioux Falls and Southeast South Dakota area, um, and it is a lot more backyarders, so you're going to have smaller uh, operations, but it's a great uh, place to share knowledge, um, share resources on chickens. Um, so yeah, and then also obviously at the feed stores in town during their chick days, which, you know, usually is in the spring, sometimes it will run all summer and into the fall. Um, so it kind of depends on, on what kind of breed you're looking for. Also, if you're looking for males or females, that's going to dictate where you buy them. 
Um, if you buy them from a hatchery, you can choose a male or a female. And it's about 98 to 99% accurate what you're gonna get. If you've chosen females, you're gonna get females. If you buy from a local breeder, um, you get something called straight run birds, um, which is a mix of male and female. And you don't know until they get a little older if you're gonna end up with roosters. And if you're in town and that's not a part of you know, a local law, that you, know, you need to be aware of that and have an exit strategy for your roosters. Um, and uh, so, you know, so that's an option. The feed stores do separate them into uh, pullets, which refers to a female um, hen, and then straight run, which is the mix of male and female. I have purchased from the pullet bin before and ended up with roosters. So it's not always 100% accurate at the feed stores. Um, Local laws are important to know for your community and where you live. Um, it, you know, your city ordinances will tell you whether you're allowed to have chickens in town or not. Um, many small towns around South Dakota are um, working to change that. And um, for example, just last summer, Brandon passed a Sioux Falls chicken ordinance. Um, before that, chickens were not allowed in Brandon. Now you, you can have up to six or maybe it's 10, I can't remember exactly. But um, that was a fun process. I was involved in that. Um, and and if, if you wanna be involved in, in that type of thing by um, you know, changing your local laws, um, it is something that, that we can kind of, I'd be happy to talk to you about offline, um, you know, the process of going to the city council and, and starting down that road. Um, it's, it's sometimes more difficult than you would think. And you, you'd think that in, a, in an agriculture state, in a small town, people wouldn't care if you had chickens in town, but a lot of people left the farm and moved to town just so they wouldn't have to be around chickens anymore. <laughs> so there is some, some opposition to that in some communities. Um, but uh, yeah, so just hit me up if you want to talk about that later. Um, choosing a breed, one of my most fun things to do is geek out on all the different breeds of chickens. And um, so there's basically a couple different categories that I kind of keep in my mind. Um, there's the heritage breed chicken, which is um, kind of like if you're a gardener, kind of like an heirloom, like an heirloom tomato. It's, it's the same breed that's been around for hundreds of years. It hasn't been, um, modified much. Um, and, and if it has been, it's just been, you know, basically made better uh, and bred in a way that, you know, those true traits for that heritage breed are even truer than they were. Um, the heritage breeds often have really good instincts still intact. Um, they have, um, you know, their temperament for that specific breed is still intact. Um, you can, um, I just, I personally prefer the heritage breeds. I like uh, helping some of those endangered breeds that might be going out. Um, and, and, you know, trying to like have more of them around. Um, you can go to the Livestock Conservancy. They have a whole list of poultry breeds that are, um, you know, they have them categorized by, you know, endangered or not with regards to disappearing from the planet. So um, that's kind of fun to, to educate yourself on. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I, I generally fill my flock with heritage breeds. I also find they're hardier. Um, they tend to, uh, really have their natural chicken instincts still intact so they can forage a lot better. Um, a lot of these uh, birds that have been modified, which are called hybrids, that's the term for the other category of birds, is maybe a bird that has been, you know, a breed that has just been created in the last 10 years. You know, it, no one had heard of it until 10 years ago or five years ago. Um, uh, they also have some of those hybrids now that um, they're called sex link birds, which means that you can tell if it's a male or female based on the color of its feathers at birth. So that, you know, that is a benefit for a lot of people is like, you want to know if you're going to get a male or a female and it's hard to sex a chicken at birth. And there used to be professional and still are professional chicken sexers at the hatcheries that will do that, um, you know, with a, with a heritage breed chicken, baby chick that, you know, they, they can tell. Um, I don't know how it's done. It's like some sort of voodoo magic, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, so that, that, uh, that's kind of an interesting uh, benefit of the hybrids is that you do get to know the sex of the bird. Um, in, in Stephanie, do you have, how many breeds do you usually keep in your flock? I mean, I probably have 20 plus at this point. Oh, wow. Yeah, I like a colorful flock. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the more diverse it is, the healthier the entire flock will be. Yeah. Um, it's, just, it's, it's better to look at, it's better to get to know them. Um, you get a wide variety of egg sizes, egg colors. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I love opening up the carton and having the rainbow of, you know, the really dark, dark browns that are almost chocolate up to, you know, the, the pure whites, to the tans, to the, the blues and greens, and even some pink hued eggs. 
And um, when you're doing wholesale, it, like that uh, still offers you enough consistency that your vendors are excited? Yeah, in fact, part of my, my whole shtick is, is to provide a flat of eggs to a restaurant that is all different colors. Yeah. Because they're so used to just getting a flat of eggs off the Cisco truck. And, you know, the uniformity is ridiculous, not only in size, color, but there's nothing, like there's no bumps on the shell. Everything is so perfect. Well, I think that's what's wrong, right, with agriculture nowadays, because we don't live in a perfect world. And we all know that growing things and raising animals is not perfect. Um, and I like to embrace the diversity of, of all the different breeds and what they can produce for us. Um, you know, the eggs are all going to taste the same based on um, how old the hen is and what you're feeding them and if they're out free ranging or not. Um, so the, you know, that's not going to, the breed isn't going to dictate the taste of the egg. Um, so yeah, so why not color, color it up and like get some fun colors. And uh, here in my presentation, I'll just touch on a couple of my favorites. One of my all time favorites here is the Plymouth Rock is the name of the breed. It's an old heritage breed from the Northeast. And it, um, this coloring is called Bard, the black and white stripes. So this is the Bard uh, Plymouth Rock. Um, great uh, friendly bird, not too friendly. They kind of take care of themselves, super good foragers. Um, yeah, they're one of my all time favorites. I also really like the, the Brahmas, B-R-A-H-M-A. -A. This is a Brahma, this is a light Brahma. They come in a multiple of colors. Um, they're what's considered a large fowl breed, which means they're a little bigger, a little heftier. They weigh a little more. They have feathered feet, which helps them in the, in the winter. They do really well in the winter here because of their um, extra size and feathering. They have a low comb, which won't get frostbite as easy as some of the bigger combs. Um, friendly bird, um, yeah, really like them a lot. They lay a decent uh, number of eggs and a decent um, size egg. Here is another very common one for backyarders. Um, it's called the Orpington. Um, this one is buff in color. So the buff Orpington, they do come in other colors. This is gonna be your golden retriever of backyard chickens. Um, she, this one was named Honker and she would jump in your lap like a dog. I mean, she was like the friendliest bird you'd, you'd ever own. They're, and they're really pretty consistent uh, brown egg layers as well. Um, also, a lot of these heritage breeds are known as dual purpose breeds, which means you could butcher them and eat them as well. Um, it's gonna be different than a meat bird, but you're gonna get um, like a more natural, you know, wild bird uh, taste and size of the breast. and um, and they really have a really good flavor. Um, here we have uh, what's known commonly as an Easter egger. This is not actually a real breed. It's kind of a made up breed, um, but they do lay the colored eggs, which is fun. And they come in all different color uh, feathering. So, you know, the really only the consistency with the Easter eggers is they're colored eggs. They have gray feet instead of yellow. And then they have these muffs um, of feathers on their cheeks. Um, but they come in every color under the rainbow with regards to feathers. So that's fun to get five or six, you know, Easter eggers that all look different and all lay different colored eggs. Um, and they're, they're one of the hardiest breeds I've had actually is the Easter eggers. Um, they've really lasted. I've got some six or seven year olds that are still laying for me periodically. Um, the Rhode Island Red, which you're all familiar with, um, another heritage breed, but I would say, and I would caution you on this one, um, most of the Rhode Island Reds now have been overbred. It's hard to find the true heritage Rhode Island Red. You'd have to search for it from a hatchery. Any of the local Rhode Island Reds you're buying either from local breeders or at the feed store are gonna have been overbred. They've lost some of their natural instincts. They become more aggressive. So you're gonna have a lot more um, fighting, infighting between the birds. I'm, you know, I used to be a fan of the Rhode Island Red um, and if you can still get the true, uh, you know, heritage, you know, temperament intact, it's good, but it's hard to find. Um, do you, they, go ahead. Do you breed any of your own chicks? So I do. I don't breed um, like specific, uh, you know, I don't, I don't keep anyone penned up uh, by breed. So I can't have purebreds. Right. Um, it's too important for me to have them out free ranging. My, my eggs are labeled pasture raised, which um, is even more than a free range egg. A free range egg is, you know, could be uh, chickens just free ranging inside a barn that never see the light of day. So, so don't be fooled by, you know, you're spending more money at the grocery store for what is labeled a free range egg. They might not actually be out in the world. <laughs> they might just be on the floor of a barn. Um, so pasture raised is kind of the next step, which indicates they are in fact out on a pasture eating bugs, grass, weeds, you know, having a, a varied diet, which really changes the quality, health of the egg for you, quality and taste of the egg. Um, 
So yeah, so that, wait, was that your question? I think I got it. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so we'll move right along here to uh, raising the chicks. Um, and once again, if you're getting chicks, it's a whole different scenario of raising them versus getting a full grown chicken. Um, so it's a lot, it is a lot more work to raise baby chicks, but it's a lot of reward and fun, especially if you have little kids. Great project for them to be involved in. Um, when my boys were small, you know, we ended up raising a, a lot of uh, little chicks here and there and, and had a great time. Oh, and, and let me just uh, go back, Jordan, to your question real quick. I, um, I do hatch um, my own, but like I said, they're what I would consider a barnyard mix. So I'll, um, you know, I have a number of roosters and a number of different breeds of roosters and hens. And so I often have hens in the summer who will go broody and who will, uh, which basically means they want to hatch eggs and they will start mm -hmm. sitting on a nest of eggs. And then I will let, depending on how many chickens I have, and if I need more, <laughs> I will let them hatch out eggs um, and let them, let the mamas raise the babies so I don't have to go through all this work that I'm about to tell you about. <laughs> um, yeah, and, uh, and so I do that. I did, I actually had a very successful year with three or four hatches. Um, each of them were 10 to 15 little babies. So I have a lot of mixed breeds right now running around out here, but once again, they are mixes of heritage breeds. So I, I you know, it works for me. So, yeah. Um, Okay, so setting up for your baby chicks, um, you do uh, need something called a brooder, which is uh, basically a, a place for them to live until they're completely feathered out. Um, they come to you with their downy fluff and they need to be kept very warm because the down does not do a uh, very good job heating them at that point. So baby chicks need to be kept at a 95 degree temperature um, inside their brooder. So we've used uh, all kinds of things as brooders. Um, my kids have built little brooder boxes, like in this photo, um, you know, for school projects, uh, you know, with a hinge lid. We used to raise them when we first started out in the house um, and with these little brood boxes, like in the family room, and that got really messy <laughs> pretty quickly. And also the dogs uh, were a little too interested in the baby chicks. So we did uh, move them out. I've now raised them either in the garage or actually out in the, the chicken run, um, which, um, I prefer now just because the mess is out there and they seem to feather out and grow up a little faster when they're um, kind of forced to. Uh, so they're out in the, in the world already and not coddled inside your house. Um, but this is a box we built. Um, we've used Rubbermaid totes here and there. We've used you know the metal galvanized or rubber um, feed troughs or watering troughs. Um, you just need to make sure you have a secure lid um, because cats or dogs are obviously interested. Um, and that they're in a secure location and you need electricity for a heat lamp. So um, I will, I don't think I have a heat lamp picture right here, but um, I also have raised them in dog crates. Here's one of those metal dog crates and I just um, put some uh, plastic wrap and some uh, around the outside so they couldn't escape through the openings. Um, that was, you know, when you're desperate and you don't know what else to put them in. Um, but you can see the red light. So what you need is a heat lamp and they sell them at the feed stores. And it's just one of those construction, you know, carpenter lights, uh, metal ones. Um, and then you put a 250 volt uh, red heat uh, bulb in there and they sell those all at the feed store by the chicken stuff. Um, and basically that keeps them warm enough. Um, some people put a thermometer in there so they really know what the temperature is. I generally use the behavior of the chick to tell me if they're too hot or too cold. So it's important to put your light to the side and not in the center of the brooder um, so that they have a chance to get away from the heat should they get too hot. So if you go out there and they're all huddled, up, huddled under the heat lamp, they're obviously too cold. And you might wanna lower your heat lamp closer to the surface of the box so they can get more heat. Um, if they're all the way over in the corner, they're too hot. So you might wanna raise your heat lamp up a little. Um, the heat lamps are incredibly flammable, very dangerous to use. <laughs> I actually um, burnt half of my garage down with one uh, two last winter. I think it was or last spring. Um, it was really awful. Um, I had one, I thought I had it clipped on secure and it fell into my brood box. It lit the pine shavings on fire and, um, you know, started a fire in the garage. We had, you know, the entire garage was totaled on the inside. We, we were able to keep the framing, um, but it was, yeah, my husband is still not um, very forgiving uh, about that one, but he did get a, a, a new garage with, um, that's insulated now. So, you know, he did get a win on that, I guess. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, so be really careful with the heat lamps. You can buy um, fire-free uh, heating sources now for baby chicks online. Um, there's things called shelf heaters um, that are these little heaters that will not pose any sort of a fire risk. They're a little more expensive, um, but you might wanna invest in that. 
Um, so the brood box, yeah. So they basically have to stay in there for six to eight weeks until they feather out. They'll lose all their down and they'll get real feathers on. Um, and at that point now they're ready to go outside. Um, it, it depends on the time of year, obviously. You're not gonna put them outside at that age when, in the dead of winter, um, but they can start moving into the coop around eight weeks, especially if it's summer. Um, and I do it gradually. And, and I also take away the heat gradually. When I know they're getting more feathers, I might start turning the, the heat lamp off during the day and only have it on at night. And then, so gradually now they're adjusting to a different temperature. And then, um, and then you know, I might, I might even sometimes move the brood box out into the coop and keep them out in the brood box inside the coop for a couple of days as they adjust to that environment. So everything, you know, if you do it gradually, you shouldn't have any problems. Um, um, yeah, so that, that's a, it's a transition you have to go through. Um, bedding for your brooder, I use the same bedding in my brooder and my coops, which is the big bales of pine shavings from the feed store. I prefer um, runnings versus tractor supply or fleet farm. The runnings bales, um, you get a little bit more for your money. I like the consistency of them. Um, they're all locally produced from uh, trees in the hills usually. Um, then you've got um, food and water. You're gonna need a special type of food for baby chicks. Um, I brought some to show you. Um, it's chick starter, which is what it's called in the, in the store. And it is, um, it's a finer uh, ground up, uh, I don't know, I don't know if you'll be able to really see it here, but it's fine little, little uh, pieces of, of chicken feed. Um, they can't have the big pellets yet. They're not old enough. So the chick starter is the way to go. And you will, they sell the chick starter in small bags and then they sell them in the 50 pound bags. Just get the 50 pound bag because I, you know, I keep my, my birds, uh, my new birds on chick starter until about 16 to 18 weeks, which is when they're gonna start um, thinking about laying you an egg. So they won't lay eggs for five months. So that's a lot of care and feeding up until when you're gonna get the egg reward back. Um, and that is why some people buy a, a chicken already at five months of age, so they can just go right into the eggs. Um, so that's an option for you um, as well, if you don't wanna go through all this rigmarole. But so the chick starter, yeah, I pretty much keep them on this. Um, the layer feed has calcium in it and calcium is bad for the liver of a baby chick um, since they're not producing eggs yet and their body doesn't know what to do with that calcium. So you need to keep them on the chick starter until they start getting ready to lay eggs. Um, so, and they're going to need a you know, separate little feeder and waterer. Um, you know, they obviously make these, uh, and I would invest in these. They're not expensive. This little guy is a feeder right here. It just keeps the food a little cleaner so they don't poop in it because um, they will crawl and poop and everything. And then the waterer here, um, I have one here. Um, you know, these are cheap too. And you don't even have to buy the plastic thing that screws on top. You can use a mason jar if it's fine. Um, but also baby chicks can drown in a dish of water. So that's why this style water is safe for them. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the food and water. Um, there's some specifics on brands of food and, and, and stuff that we can, um, I'm not going to get into, um, but, but I do, I do want to let you know that I sell a local, locally, um, grown, locally sourced, locally milled, um, GMO free organic chicken feed here from my farm. Um, I'm a distributor for, uh, K Creek Ranch in Canby, Minnesota. They're an amazing diversified um, pasture-based uh, farm up there. They raise a lot of grass-fed meats. Um, he grows all of this feed and mills it. Um, and then I distribute it from down here to backyard chicken owners. So if any, I, that's available on my website, you can order it by the pound. Um, and then we can make arrangements for pickup. And I have a chick starter from him and I also have a layer feed. Um, and I would just say that, you know, I, I switched over to his feed um, maybe two years ago or one and a half years ago. And I've seen a huge change in the health of my flock. Um, you are what you eat, as we all know. And, um, you know, I basically got tired of opening up bags of feed from the feed store and all I could smell were chemicals coming out of them. Um, so it, it was really refreshing to find Lyle up there and get to know him and his family. Um, and he, uh, so his feed, it's ground a little finer um, than what you find at the store, um, if you can see it there. Um, but it's a great um, mix. He's got a great recipe um, and it's got minerals and um, vitamins. It's got calcium, it's got kelp, um, barley, flaxseed, uh, corn, oats, soy, 
Um, he's got a, it's just a great mix. And it's something where you open it up and you really think you could pour this in a bowl, add some warm milk and some maple syrup and have it for breakfast yourself and you would be fine. <laughs> I wouldn't do that with the feed from the feed store. <laughs> um, yeah, so food and water, important. Um, heat, we already covered. Cleaning the brooder, you do have to clean the brooder every one or two weeks when it starts looking too poopy. Um, so, it, but it's not a huge deal to do. And you can take those old shavings and you can sprinkle them um, on your garden, in your flower beds or in your compost pile. Um, uh, let's see, socializing the babies. They're super fun to play with. Um, you know, the more you handle them when they're little, the friendlier they're gonna be as grown up chickens and the more they can be your actual pets. <laughs> um, and kids love to play with them. I would just caution with little kids, um, you know, they are fragile little little chicks. Um, you might wanna supervise, these are my boys. We would take the chicks out into a little pen in the yard when they were little and, um, you know, the kids would play with them. Um, yeah, so we, we had a lot of fun here. We're doing um, what we call roosting lessons with a, with a flock of buff Orpingtons. Um, and that was in the house on a towel. <laughs> um, yeah, kids love love chicks. They're super fun. Um, and then I've already touched on the male female pullet versus cockerel. Um, you're really not going to know at the beginning, um, and you know unless you've chosen females from the hatchery. Um, but generally, I start seeing around eight to ten weeks some behavior that would indicate a rooster to me. Um, I'm not an expert by any means, but I can generally tell uh, based on how they're behaving. You know, when you reach into the coop and all the chicks run away from you, except that one that runs towards you, that generally is going to be your rooster. <laughs> so there are ways to tell, but they will start crowing sometimes around 12 to 16 weeks. So um, then you'll, you'll start noticing. And also they might get a large, their comb gets a little bigger and a little redder faster than the other ones. Um, so that's you, kind of, uh, go what's ahead. What's those roosters then, Stephanie, or do you sell them off or? So I do a variety of things with my extra roosters. Um, I, I shift roosters. I, I like to have one or two head roosters that, you know, are here all the time. They're super good for protection. They, um, whenever there's a aerial predator, like a hawk or an eagle, uh, my roosters will call out an alarm call and everyone will either freeze in place or run under something to hide. Um, I've had my dog get out to try and chase chickens and eat them. And, um, you know, the rooster, the chickens run away from the dog. The rooster runs towards the dog. And so actually, I've had roosters sacrifice themselves um, and have not made, you know, the dog is one. Um, but all the hens were saved. So it's really amazing to watch. Um, but yeah, so I ended up, I end up with a lot of roosters come through here and, and any given year. And um, if it's a purebred rooster, I will first try and sell it on one of those Facebook pages. Um, or I'll give it away on one of the Facebook pages. I'll also give away the non-purebreds. Um, if no one wants them, then sometimes I'll butcher them. And, you know, they're not always the tastiest, but they're great to make bone broth out of. Um, they're great for um, chicken soup. Um, and I've done that. I know that, uh, I don't know if you guys have done any of the, any of the well, there's been some meat preservation talk here in this conference. Um, so there's ways to can chicken um, that way. Um, so yeah, and then I also um, I also have a couple, uh, there's a couple people around the state who will buy the birds from you for two or three bucks a bird um, and turn around and butcher them and use them. So there's a, quite a lot of options uh, for, for getting rid of them if you really need to. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about the, the coop and the run, which I said was one of your biggest um, you know, categories of price-wise and your biggest uh, investment. Um, there's a variety of different coop styles, um, sizes, styles, everything. You can, um, I'll just show you through a couple that we've had and where we got them so you can kind of get an idea. This coop we ordered online um, from, you know, it was like, you know, chickencoops.com or something like that. <laughs> I don't even remember, but it basically came as a kit. It came all flat in freight boxes and you just had to assemble it, um, you know, and then we had to put shingles on. Um, but it was great. I mean, I, I think we spent like a thousand dollars on this, which if I had bought all that, those supplies and the time to build that myself, I probably would have been deeper than a thousand in. So um, I felt like that was a great investment. I think it's about four foot by eight foot. It, it easily fits, um, you know, 20 birds is a max, I think for that size coop, but you can, you could have 10 birds in there and you'd be really good, well off. Um, and then, so we, then what we do with our coops is we add a run to the outside of them. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like. We, you know, we, we built the run ourselves. Um, and it's basically an option for your, um, for your birds to be able to leave the coop, which is what they sleep in, to go and still get an outside experience. But if you aren't ready to free range yet, 
Um, so, you know, if you left them just in the coop all day long without access to outdoors, it, you would have problems with behavior and health. Um, so to get them out is really important. Um, you know, if you're not sure you want to let them free range in your yard yet, this is a good option for you. The bigger the run, the better. I would strongly urge you. I can tell you that a chicken um, does need more space than you would think. Um, inside the coop where they're sleeping and laying their eggs, they need two to fit four square feet per hen. Um, out in a, uh, a run space area, they really ideally should have 10 square feet per hen. Um, so if you have six birds, you should have a 60 square foot um, run. And I know that sounds big, but um, if you're never gonna let them out, um, you're, gonna, you're gonna be happy you put in a run this large. Um, they are not meant to be cooped up. <laughs> um, and you know they, for their health um, and the health of the eggs, it's really better to let them out if you can, although I understand that is a decision. And when you do decide to free range, you know, there's a chance of loss to predators. There's all kinds of possibilities. So it is something you have to consider. Um, so yeah, so we basically attach these runs to our coops. Uh, we build a ramp um, and then we kind of box that ramp in so that that's also enclosed. We enclose all of our um, structures. Uh, we don't use chicken wire, and I would strongly urge you not to use chicken wire. Um, it's you know the green flexible stuff. It has round or oct 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 octagon openings, <laughs> um, and uh, and it's it's really easy for a predator, even a raccoon, to just bend that open and crawl in. It's really not predator proof at all. The stuff we put around our runs is called hardware cloth. It's made out of galvanized steel. It comes in rolls from the hardware store. You can get different size openings in the metal and we use the half inch openings. It's not easy to work with. You have to wear gloves, it's sharp. You need some good tin snips to cut it, um, but you can unroll it on the framing and then just staple it um, onto the framing. Um, we use that for everything and really like it. Um, we uh, bought, uh, there's local guys who make coops. This coop was made by a local um, South Dakota guy named Greg Peterson. Um, he's not related to me. Um, he has an awesome business of building these chicken coops. He come in, they come in all sizes. You choose the color, he'll paint them whatever color you want. He actually has, his I think uh, can be insulated or not insulated. He has electricity running in there if you need it. Um, he'll deliver it to your place. Um, he puts them up, you know, he has them on skids so they can be drug around. Um, we set them up on railroad ties um, here. But yeah, they're really cute um, and they're great coops. So you could get a local builder. Um, you could build your own, like I said, I've never been that that um, aggressive and my husband isn't really into that. So <laughs> um, we did build, like I said, the mobile coop wagon by piecing a bunch of strange used things together. Um, and then uh, yeah, there's something called a tractor, a chicken tractor also. So these are permanent coops that stay in one, one place in your yard. Um, a, tr a chicken tractor is a coop that's a little smaller and lighter weight than these, but you can actually move it around. It might have wheels on two sides the little house, uh, the coop where they sleep, and then the run is all contained in one little box. Um, and then you can move your chickens around your yard without having them free ranging. Um, that's a, a good benefit too for people who are ready to free range. Um, let's see, so that's tra tractors versus permanent. Um, predator proofing, you know, I touched on that. The hardware cloth is really good, um, super strong. I also take um, hardware cloth. Um, so for example, this window here, whether it's glass or plexiglass, I've had dogs break through that glass to get into the coop um, and other predators would do that too. So I take a sheet of uh, just like a little piece of the hardware cloth and we staple it over the top of this um, so that nothing can get through. Um, you wanna make sure all your hooks are, are secure, your latches, um, nothing can open them, a uh, uh, raccoon can't open them. Um, yeah, so, and you know, that's just uh, predator proofing to think about because, you know, predator, everybody loves chicken. Everybody loves it. <laughs> it's delicious. <laughs> um, okay, so bedding, I, I talked about bedding already. I just used the, the, um, the pine shavings. Um, really, I kind of do a, a setup where I only end up cleaning out my coops twice a year. And the way I do that is, I will show you, this is a brand new, freshly cleaned coop. I won't show you what it looks like a few months after this. <laughs> But um, we take the inside of our coops and we kind of um, take out everything that is the manufacturer put in and we redo it the way we want it. And so this black and white thing here, we call, this is called a dropping board. So we just build out a little frame and we take a piece of plywood and we cover it with um, linoleum adhesive squares. And we put that under the roofs. The roofs are where they're gonna sleep at night. Um, a chicken will just poop all night long while it's sleeping. 
So all that poop is just gonna gather down here in your, in your bedding and just, you're gonna have to clean it out more frequently. So if you do a setup like this all night long, they're pooping onto this board. I have a big metal drywall skate scraper and a bucket. And so ideally every morning you could go out there, you could scrape the poop into your bucket and throw it in your compost pile. And that way you're really keeping this bedding underneath clean. Um, I then stir this bedding regularly, like maybe twice a month with a rake or something. Um, and any poop that's in there kind of just naturally uh, decomposes. Um, and this is kind of referred to as the deep litter method. And you can find all kinds of stuff online about that. Um, the deep litter method is basically you keep it deep enough so that, and you're stirring it. So it's constantly composting itself. Um, and you really rarely have to change it out. Um, I add one thing to this bedding. I add something called diatomaceous earth, otherwise known as DE. Um, and it's basically a natural product. It's made out of the diatoms from the ocean floor, which are these little creatures. Um, I, you know, I'm not a scientist, so I can't get too deep into that. Um, but they grind them up and it's a, it's a very fine white powder that you can buy. I always make sure I get the food grade variety of it um, because if the chickens are gonna be rolling in it or eating it in any way, I wanna make sure it's safe for them. Um, it's, it acts as a drying agent. So it dries out the droppings, keeps the bedding dry. It also will help with lice and mites which um, all animals um, you know, could have lice or mites on them. And this will, um, will, it actually works on the eggs and the droppings of the lice and mites and, and kills, kills the eggs before they can hatch. Um, so it's just a nice product to have. I keep a bag of it and an old flour sifter and I just will scoop some up and sift it around the top of the bedding and then stir it in. And I might do that you know, once a month. Um, just to keep it nice and dry. You do need to wear a mask. That's incredibly important when using this product. It's got naturally occurring silica in it, which is really harmful for your respiratory tract. It is a little controversial in the chicken world. There are some chicken keepers who swear it hurts the respiratory tracts of the chickens. Um, I haven't seen any uh, evidence of that. So I've used it for years and haven't had a problem. Also cuts down on some of your flies, which I find useful. Um, so that's kind of cleaning. Nesting boxes, you do need some sort of nesting box for your, for your chickens. You don't need one nesting box per hen. Generally, the rule is, um, what is the rule? The rule is one nesting box for every three to five hens because they like to share a box. Um, so what you'll see is like they all, they might wait in line just to use that one box, even though there's open boxes over here. Um, and there's a biological reason for that. You know, out in the wild, they're gonna lay their eggs where it's safe. And if they see eggs already in one spot, they know and assume that that's a safe spot. Nothing has eaten those eggs yet, so it must be a good place. So I'm gonna add my eggs to that pile. Um, so they will do that. Um, I put curtains on my nesting boxes and I don't just do it because it's adorable, but it really is. Um, but it does serve a purpose as well. And I just take a strip of fabric, no sewing required. I staple it up there and then just cut it up with scissors. Um, Chickens like to have a nice, dark, safe place where they feel secure to lay their eggs. I like to provide that for them. Um, I have had instances before I put the curtains up where um, chickens, um, you know, as a chicken is laying an egg, they are sometimes in a position where they're exposing their vent, which is the hole the egg comes out of, um, to the outside world. And um, it's red and chickens are attracted to the color red and I would have some other meaner hens who would peck the vent of the chicken that was laying and cause um, injury. So, so this also keeps other prying eyes away while a chicken is laying its egg. Um, and um, it, it also keeps them from sleeping in there at night um, because you don't want them sleeping in the nesting boxes at night. Like I said, they will poop all night long in your nesting box and then your eggs will get poop on them. So it's a, it's a sanitary reason as well. Um, all right, ventilation is super important in your coop, the, the sleeping part, part of your the, the building they're sleeping in, um, especially in the winter. Um, so I will, I will kind of touch on that real briefly. So, uh, you know, you have a chicken's natural body temperature is about 107 degrees. So they uh, put off a lot of heat. And when you get six to 10 of them in a coop at, you know, in the dead of winter, um, and they're, they're, they're pooping. So you've got the ammonia in their droppings. Um, their breathing, their heat, you're gonna have a lot of humid air inside your, your coop, um, a lot of moisture. And in the dead of winter, what'll happen is that moisture will turn to frostbite on their, their, uh, their root, uh, on their um, combs and their wattles and on their feet. So you want a way for that humid, warm air to escape out of your coop. 
Um, it's, it's not good to leave windows open around where they're roosting because that draft is not good for them. So it's good to have something on the roof of your coop, uh, a ventilation system. Um, some of the coops you buy come with a ridge vent along the roof, which will allow some of that hot air to escape. Um, you can add, um, oops, sorry about that. Forgot to turn my phone off. <laughs> um, um, you can add events. So what we've done, in, for example, in this coop, and I don't have a picture of it, I'll just describe it to you, is we took a saw and we cut out a rectangular shape right up here, um, maybe two inches by six inches on both ends of the of the coop. And then we covered that with a just a, a cheap uh, metal um, heater vent from that you'd put on your heat vent on the floor in your house um, to keep it uh, secure from predators. And now, and, and we have a ridge vent also in this coop. So all that heat will then rise up and it will go out through the ridge vent and out those side vents um, in the winter. So that's really helpful. I added those side vents because I was noticing more frostbite. I was noticing um, icicles forming on the roof of my coop inside in the winter. So I, that was an indication to me that there's too much moisture in there. I need to, to have more ventilation. Um, so you can add you know, whatever you need for that. Another thing we do in the winter is we cover our runs in this plastic here. Oh, I can't get that to blow up any further. Um, well, anyway, so we, we buy these rolls of plastic um, and then we basically, it takes two people, you just kind of unroll it on the run and then we use furring strips and wood screws to hold it intact. And that keeps it from snowing inside your run. You don't have to shovel out the snow, keeps the wind out. It's really good in the winter. Um, um, and then, you know, you can just basically take it off and reuse it for a number of years before you have to replace it. Um, roll it back up and then put it back on in the fall. So we've done that, which is really helpful. So that's really the only change we make in the winter. We do not heat our coops. Like I said, the chickens are high temp animals. Um, I don't believe it's healthy to heat them. I think it's better to let them just gradually adjust to the winter like we all do. Um, they, will, they will be fine without heating. And plus it's a danger for fire to keep your coops heated. Um, I also don't even really think it's, uh, an insulation is necessary. I feel like in my insulated coops, when it's like really, it's just too warm in there and they, they do get more frostbite. Um, so that's that space we talked about. We talked about winter seasonal. Um, this is just another picture of our setup, which you know we've got this tan coop back here, this turquoise coop here, which we don't have anymore, and everything fed into this one run, um, which was kind of nice. We do have automatic doors um, from our coops into our run. We have automatic doors, so they're really awesome. They're an investment. I think they cost anywhere from 150 to 200 dollars. But the way they work is they run on a solar panel. So, and they have a light diode. So the light diode senses when the sun rises in the morning and um, the solar panel powers the, the battery which powers the engine. And then when the sun rises, that door will just automatically open. The chickens can leave the coop and go into the run for the day and access their food and water. And then they're waiting in there until I let them out. Um, at night, the light diode senses um, the sun setting and darkness coming, so it will shut the door automatically. Then it will open it one more time in case there's any stragglers who didn't make it in, and it will shut it again permanently. Um, it's super great. I don't have to worry about getting up early in the morning and getting the chickens out. Um, you know, we use, I think, four of these types of doors now. Um, if you want information on, on brands, I've you know, we, we've just bought four of the same brand because we love them so much and I've never had a malfunction. Um, they come in a couple different sizes, uh, super handy to have. So um, yeah, it's, a, it's good, good investment. Um, let's see, oh, and then uh, I'll just tell you one other thing, like I don't know how big of a situation you all are gonna get, but I hang my feeders, um, keep some cleaner, keeps, you know, keeps some, the chickens from trying to roost on them or poop in them, um, really good method. Um, I do not put my food and water inside the coop because I don't want more moisture in there. I don't want water to spill in there. I don't want rodents to be attracted um, to the inside of the coop. I'd rather they stay out of there. Um, so we keep our food and water in the run. Um, I do have a watering system that might be bigger than what any of you would be interested in, but this is a 50 gallon barrel. There's a guy in Mitchell who builds these and sells them. They're amazing. Um, they have what's called uh, these nipple, it's a nipple waterer. So these are these little metal chicken nipples, poultry nipples on the outside that the chicken pecks at and the water comes out. It's kind of like, you know, the hamster or the, the rabbit waterers. Um, you fill it through a hole in the top. It's got a submersible stock tank heater that is inside of it that I, has an electrical cord coming out. So I run, um, I run electricity out there with a, a 
with a cord in the winter, um, it keeps your water from freezing all winter long. Because frozen water in the winter is one of your biggest pains in the butts when you're raising chickens. Um, so this is a really good setup. They do make um, electric waters that are look similar to this feeder, which are the you know, red and white ones from the feed store that just plug in. Those work well too. They're not gonna last um, multiple, multiple seasons. Eventually they break, um, but that's good for a smaller operation. Um, but I have a couple of, this, of these barrel uh, uh, waters and they're fantastic. Plus you only have to fill them like once every two weeks or once a month. Um, yeah, oh, and here's the, elect the, the doors. I'll give you a close up on that. That's what they look like. Um, here's the solar panel that runs them. That's the light diode there. So those are really nifty. You can get pretty automated um, when it comes to chickens, um, which makes caring for them a lot easier. Okay, that's pretty much that. Let's see, I think um, we'll go on. We talk, we, we'll talk a little bit more about food. We did touch on some of this already. Um, we talked about the different food. Um, like I said, you can you can get the pellet. And also for, for adult birds at the feed store, should you choose uh, getting your food there, they do have a pellet and a crumble size. It's the same food, it's just in different shapes. So you can see which, which uh, your bird prefers, your birds like better. Um, some people claim there's more waste and more of it gets spilled on the ground with certain um, consistencies. Um, let's see. So, um, you're going to need, the, another thing they often sell at the feed store is um, what they call scratch grains or cracked corn, big 50 pound bags of that. That should be treats for your, uh, for your birds. It should not be their sole source of food. They say that about 10% of their diet should come from um, treats like that. And the other 80%, 90% should be from an actual um, layer feed that has the right vitamins, minerals, and calcium in it. So that's important. Um, but yeah, I like to, to give them the, I, I, I don't give them corn at all in the summer because it increases their metabolism and heats them up. But I do use it a lot in the winter. So um, at night I might, you know, spread some, some scratch grains or some corn all around the floor of their run um, just to kind of um, give them a little oomph before they go to bed on a cold night. Um, also, if it's too snowy and they're bored, it's nice to sprinkle that around. It gives them something to do and forage for. Um, like I said, they can eat all your chicken scraps or your kitchen scraps from your kitchen, which is really great. There are a few things that they're not supposed to eat. And I mentioned it here. There's a website called backyardchickens.com. Good resource for all things chicken and lots of information on different breeds on that website. And they have a treat chart, which tells you what chickens can and cannot safely eat. Um, the only thing I really stay away from is anything in the potato family, um, raw a raw potato or your raw potato peelings, you should definitely not feed to your chickens. It can kill them overnight. Um, but I really haven't come across anything else that will actually kill them yet. <laughs> um, they are omnivores, so they are not vegetarian. They love to eat um, bugs and worms. And I've seen them take down nests of baby mice. <laughs> They'll eat frogs, snakes, chickens will eat anything. Um, so I even feed them like our leftover meat scraps, you know, so that they'll eat, they'll eat anything. Um, this is when I used to have more time and have a smaller flock on cold winter days. I would make them um, special uh, uh, breakfasts of um, oatmeal with hot water and, you know, cinnamon and some different herbs that are healthy for them. Oregano is, acts as an, a natural antibacterial um, and antimicrobial. Um, yeah, so, so they, I uh, used to pamper them a lot more than I do now. Um, also, this time of year, perfect use for old pumpkins. Um, I do end up collecting a lot of pumpkins from the community and um, we have fun. My, my teenage sons have fun out there with the pumpkins and, and they take an ax and just go to town, <laughs> cutting open the pumpkins, releasing some aggression, uh, and then the chickens benefit from that. And pumpkin does act as a natural dewormer for, for chickens, so it's good for them. Um, I talked about the waterer. Um, another thing you might be interested in the winter is these flexible hoses, um, which are made for winter use. So they weigh uh, like four pounds or two pounds um, when they're not filled with water and they're very small. They have a latex uh, interior uh, covered with this um, fabric. And so basically they're expandable. So they might look as if they're only 50 feet long, but once water gets through them, they blow up kind of like a balloon and will go hundred feet. Um, easy to use in the winter. Um, they don't last forever. Um, you have to take really good care of them because that latex on the inside will pop. 
Um, so it's just, you just have to treat them kind of with kid gloves, but it's a good option versus like in the winter, having to pull out a regular garden hose, which we all know is a pain in the butt in the winter. Uh, and these should be kept inside in like a heated garage or maybe in um, a mud room or something. Um, so they're not exposed to the cold. Okay, let's see. I don't even know what time it is and I don't know where I am here. How are we doing? One o'clock. Okay, good. We're doing good. good. Yeah, we're moving Stephanie, right along. We had one more question. <laughs> Folks were just wondering, uh, what is the name of the company that makes the electric doors again? Okay, so um, I will have to double check, but I'm pretty sure the website, I could probably look it up. Um, you know what? I'll look it up um, and I'll put it in the in the chat here, okay. where I get a second. Um, I want to say this brand of door that we use is called the Pullet Shut Door. P-U-L-L-E-T Shut Door. And so I think if you just Google that, you might find um, it's a website that only sells that specific door. They don't sell anything else. Um, I appreciate that in a manufacturer because then they become experts on that one thing. Um, and so with chicken products, I've done that a lot, um, you know, bought things from a, a manufacturer who just makes that one thing and then makes it perfectly. Um, there are other styles of, of automatic doors out there. This is just the only one I've used. So it's the only one I can speak to uh, at this point. And then uh, do you have the contact information for the gentleman that makes the water? Yes, um, that's another good thing. Um, will you just like add that to the chat just to remind me and then I'll go back in and add his name. Um, yep. I really, the only way I've reached out to him and contacted him, I think is through Messenger on Facebook. Um, so I can I can drop his name in there. I wouldn't have his phone number. So you'd have to kind of search for him on Facebook probably. Okay. Um, oh, I think I remember. I think it's, um, no, I don't remember it. I'll, I'll add it, I'll add it when I'm done here. Just, just give me a, 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 a reminder by just saying that in the chat. Will do. And then I'll take a look at it. Um, okay, so that pretty much covers food. Oh, one other thing about food I didn't mention is calcium. So layer feed has calcium in it, but actually they need more calcium than that. So you, it's important to offer a, a free choice calcium option for them. Um, and at the feed stores, they sell 50 pound bags of crushed up oyster shell. And that's just what I've always used. It's super easy, inexpensive. Um, I just keep a completely separate feeder full of oyster shell. And they will just self-select how much they need and eat what they need. Um, I don't mix it into their food. Um, I like to keep it separate just so they, they can just figure it out on their own um, and take as much as they want. Um, one other important thing um, is the grit issue. So um, once again, I'm not a scientist and I should know more about the anatomy of a chicken than I do. Someday I will. But um, you know, they, the way they uh, digest their food is the food goes in their mouth, it goes down into their gizzard, it'll sit there and that's where it gets ground up. In order to grind it up so they can digest it, they need, um, they need grit. And any bird is like this, I believe. Um, um, so some sort of sand or pebbles or stones that they keep, that they will eat, and then that grinds up the food for them. So, um, you know, since my birds are out free ranging, they get that naturally. You know, they'll just help themselves to a dusty corner and some stones or gravel or whatever, and everything's fine. If you have them it contained and they don't have access to any ground of any uh, per se, or, you know, uh, it's, you can buy um, grit at the store. And it's basically bags of small grab of little pieces of gravel. Um, and that's kind of goofy, I know, but like, so you also could just go out to a dirt road and probably scoop up some gravel and some dirt, although you then would probably have some pollutants in there from cars. So you think about that, I don't know if you care. Um, uh, so yeah, they do need uh, uh, access to grid of some kind. Um, let's see here. Okay, that I think covers that. So this is just like a little, a little, a little information on, um, you know, personality and some just added on things that I've, I've, I've mentioned. So we talked about free ranging. Like I said, it's a choice. Um, if you have a really pristine backyard with beautiful flowers and, you know, gorgeous garden, the chickens um, will destroy it. <laughs> so you need to be aware of that. You, you're going to need to fence them out of your garden. You're, um, you know, if you have established flower beds with bigger plants and bushes and, and perennials, you're probably going to be okay. But if you are one who plants brand new annuals every year, um, I wouldn't let your chickens near them. <laughs> um, they also, another benefit of the free range though, is that like for your garden, for example, 
um, before you've started planting at the start of the year, it's great to let your chickens in there. They will just go to town on that dirt. They will aerate it. They will till it for you. They will um, have fun with the worms, um, you know, work the ground for you before you plant, which is nice. And then the same thing at the end of the season when you're done. When you're done with your garden, let the chickens in there. Um, they'll, you know, they'll do a pretty good job of, you know, of tearing things down and eating leftover uh, produce that you don't didn't collect. Um, so they're kind of good that way. Um, yeah, so the free range thing, you, know, you just have to make that decision. But I think that um, when, you, when, you, when you get to know an animal and you take care of an animal and you see the, the personality and their preferences and the health benefits of them, want, you know, they want to be out. They want to be out exploring. Um, and if you have just a fenced in yard, they generally will stay inside that fenced in yard. Um, the only thing I, I, you know, I used to have them free ranging in town and I had a four foot fence um, and they would fly out of the fence only if something was chasing them. Um, so, you know, once in a while they'd end up in a neighbor's yard, but, um, but that was all. Otherwise they stuck around close to home. And chickens, they know that things like to eat them, so they don't like to get very far away from their coop. And when darkness comes, believe me, dusk, they head back home. Their naturally, in, natural instinct is to do that. So you're not gonna have to put them to bed at night. They go to bed on their own. Um, dust baths, that's important. And I'll show you a picture of some of my roosts. These are actually three roosters or maybe it's one hen and two roosters, all taking a dust bath together. So they use the dust baths as a way to keep their feathers clean. It truly is a bath for them. Um, it keeps the lice and the mites at bay. Um, you know, it, it feels good when they're regrowing new feathers. Um, and, and when it first happened to my chickens, I thought it was the chicken was dying. I found it, you know, in this <laughs> corner of the barn, uh, you know, rolling around. I thought it was like having a seizure or something. <laughs> And then I realized it's actually supposed to be doing this. So they'll find a nice, sunny, the dustiest spot on the farm. And, you know, sometimes there's 10 of them all like together, just rolling around in the dirt, flipping it around. And it's, it's adorable. They have a great time. So it's important to have access to that. Um, you know, maybe if you just have a corner of your run that you can dedicate to dust bathing, keep it really dusty and dirty. Um, you can also use wood ash from a wood burning fireplace. The magnesium, the vitamins in that is good for them, good for their skin. It's even good for them to ingest. Um, you know, you can, um, I've seen people use old tires um, and, and make a dust bath inside of there full of sand. Um, you can cover the entire floor of your run in sand and they will find a spot there to dust bathe in. Um, so that's, that's kind of good. Um, molting. So if you've heard of chickens molting, this is a picture of a chicken molting. Um, it, what happens is in the fall, they generally um, will lose some of their feathers and regrow their feathers. And they do have a molt every fall, but um, sometimes there's, there's a hard molt and there's a soft molt. So if a chicken has a hard molt, it might only do that once every couple of years. And it will sometimes lose every single one of its feathers. And it be, it, it's, it's really scary because it can happen like overnight where your chicken, this is the same breed. This is one who's not molting in the background. And this is her sister who is and, and is having a hard molt by the looks of it. Um, so she lost like almost all of her feathers and was practically naked. And it, it's, it's just a natural uh, transition they have to go through. Um, they are very sensitive to the touch during this time. I, I, I avoid picking them up at, at all. Those new pin feathers as they grow in, they're, they're a little painful and uncomfortable. Um, during the molt, they will stop laying eggs. So there could be uh, you know, a month or maybe even two months where this hen isn't gonna lay a single egg. She's putting all of her resources into growing new feathers. Um, I also sometimes switch to a higher protein diet during this time if it looks like they're really having a rough time. Um, and so I might just switch back to a chick starter because a chick starter usually hovers around an 18% protein, um, I think, and it just gives them a little more boost to grow the feathers. Um, you know, but you also might have, a, a, you know, like her sister who might be molting right there, may have stopped laying eggs for a couple of weeks, but didn't lose hardly any feathers or none that I noticed. That would be a soft molt. Um, so there's just something to, to be aware of and note that usually happens in the fall. Um, pecking order is a real thing, people. It is so real. And like here at night, everyone's in bed. And um, you wouldn't know this by looking, but all of the hens on the top row, including this rooster here, they are uh, the dominant birds in my flock. Um, the dominant birds will get the highest roost, so they're the safest from predators. Um, so there's a big fight every night about who's going to sleep where. 
And I generally try to stay away at bedtime because it's a little upsetting. <laughs> They're all fighting with each other and pecking each other and shoving each other off the roost and taking each other's spots. And it, it sounds a little crazy in there, um, but they have to work it out. And sometimes they have to work it out every night. Um, and uh, yeah, like this guy is a young rooster, so he has to stay on the bottom. <laughs> um, so yeah, but that's, that's kind of how they work out the pecking order. And so you'll have some hens that are gonna be, um, you know, mean to the other hens and, and that is just natural. And as long as no one's drawing blood, um, you're probably gonna be okay. Um, injuries and diseases, I'm not gonna get too deep into that. I have another whole like two hour class that I teach on veterinary care for chickens and how to deal with injuries and diseases. If you're just getting, you know, five to 10 hens in a backyard situation, you're probably not gonna have a lot of, of, of these kind of problems. Um, when I had a small number of birds, I never saw any sickness or really any injuries. It wasn't until I grew my flock larger and you know, I started seeing a lot of things. And I think I've now pretty much had uh, the majority of things go wrong that couldn't go wrong. Um, we've had you know, uh, respiratory viruses go through the whole flock. We've had um, predator attacks of all kinds from all different types of predators and we've you know, I, I've taught myself how to give penicillin shots to chickens. Um, we've, you know, we've done wound care. We've uh, had all kinds of crazy things that we've had to do. Uh, part of that obviously also is, you know, being prepared for euthanization should that, uh, that, that need to be done. Um, it's never easy and I'm still not good at it. And, um, you know, when we first started out, you know, we were basically kind of city folk moving to the country and, you know, how do you kill a chicken that needs to be killed? Well, you know, I remember YouTubing and trying to figure it out the first time. So, um, yeah, there's a variety of ways to do it. Um, I'm not going to get into that either. Um, but yeah, you kind of need to be prepared as you are with any animal. Um, you know, there, there's going to be an end of life for all creatures and, um, you want it to be as dignified as possible. So uh, something to think through um, at some point is how you're gonna handle that should the time um, come. Um, let's see, so that's kind of injuries and diseases. Um, one, I'll show you this picture. I don't know if you can see it very well, but these two hens have started losing feathers on their back. And what caused that is if you do have a rooster, they will mate with the hen, obviously, um, whenever they need to or want to. And uh, what generally happens is the rooster will have some favorites and will end up over mating with those hens. And over time, after getting on the hen's back numerous times, they'll start losing some feathers on their back. So generally what I do in that situation is they do make a prop, uh, you can make these yourselves. They're called the hen saddles. And they're just so adorable. And they come in all different styles and sizes and colors. And they're not just for fashion, they actually serve a very good purpose. Um, the hen wears it like a backpack. So you just put one wing through it and the other wing through it and it sits on their back like a little saddle. And then now when the rooster is mating with them, his claws aren't gonna hurt their back or uh, you know, cause any harm to them. Um, and I generally will like put one on a hen and just leave it on, you know, for a week or two and just check under there every once in a while, make sure everything's okay and she's not getting like moisture or any sort of infection. And then you can just throw them in the washing machine and put new ones on. Um, I, you can buy these on Etsy from a bunch of different people. You can make your own. Um, I, I have a gal in Michigan, I think, this uh, 16 year old gal who this is her business. She makes these. You can choose your fabric. Um, and so I always buy my hen saddles from her. She's super sweet. And I can probably also add her contact or her name in the chats. Um, but yeah, like I said, there's a bunch of varieties of these and they're handy to have if you're gonna have roosters. Um, yeah, okay, so that's that. Um, I will go, I have a resource. Oh no, eggs. We'll do a brief little chat about eggs. We've talked a little bit about them. I told you that they don't start laying until around five months of age. Um, you might have an, an early bloomer who gives you an egg at 18 weeks. You might have a late bloomer who doesn't lay till 24 weeks of age. Don't be alarmed. Just make sure they're getting layer feed at that point and enough calcium to produce an egg. Um, sometimes your hens will stop laying eggs and there's a variety of reasons for that. One is the molting, which I mentioned to you. Um, if they had a predator scare, if the dog got out and chased them one day, if something was, you know, uh, at night was trying to get into their coop, you didn't even realize it. It could uh, stop them from laying eggs for sometimes up to a week. Um, so they, you know, they're freaked out. It's like kind of put everything in, in lockdown mode until they think it's safe again to start up. Um, the winter, they will definitely decrease their laying in the winter. Um, their uh, laying is dictated by the hours of daylight. 
that they get. Um, so their pineal gland is what um, controls the egg laying. So um, if, you know, they basically need 16 hours of daylight um, every day to lay an egg. And what'll happen is, you know, once we get into the dark, gloomy fall and winter here, you're down to 10 to 12 hours of daylight if you're lucky. Um, so you will see a decrease in the winter uh, on the eggs. Um, some people do add a light to their coop in order to, in, to keep the hens laying throughout the winter. So, and that's fine, but you do need to know the pros and cons of that. So a chicken is born with the number of eggs in its body that it's gonna lay over its whole lifetime, just like a female human. Um, you know, like if you were to butcher a chicken at laying age, you would find, you know, 565 little teeny eggs down in there, just waiting to grow into a full size egg. Um, so, or whatever the number is, I don't know the exact number, but um, so the question is, do you want your chicken to lay those eggs over those 500 and some eggs or whatever over the course of three to five years? So you're not getting an egg every day, but you're getting eggs throughout the course of the chicken's life. Or do you wanna force the chicken to lay eggs all winter? So you get an egg every day, but then by the time the chicken is two years old, it's not gonna have any more eggs left in its body. So that's just something to know, right? Like, like at that point, you have a two-year-old hen who's not laying eggs anymore, and now you need to figure out what to do with it. Um, so, so, you know, it, it's no judgment. You can do either one. Um, you know, with my production flock, I do, I did add a light last year. Um, and I bought this really amazing lighting system. And once again, it's a manufacturer that just makes this lighting system and nothing else. It's called the Hen Light, and I think it's henlight.com. They have a large um, system that's pretty pricey that's for uh, production flocks and pastured poultry folks who are really uh, have a lot of birds. I bought what's called their backyarder, which also isn't cheap. I think it was $100 to $150, um, but it worked fine for my size. Um, I'm going to try to describe it to you with this picture. This is the inside of my mobile coop wagon. The light is, is hanging right here. It's facing, the beams face the roost where the chickens sleep at night. Here is the little control panel. And so basically this system has, to, it does not run on a solar panel. So I do have to run an electrical cord out there to power it. However, it does have a solar panel and a light diode. And the way this works, it's pretty complex. And if you go to the website, you can totally geek out on it. It's super exciting. They figured out the exact rays of UV um, the, the, the colors and everything that um, really stimulates the pineal gland of a chicken. So it's the exact combination of reds, yellows, and oranges um, that come out of this light. They're perfect for the, for the gland of the chicken. The light itself will sense how many hours of daylight there were yesterday using the light diode. So it calculates you know, in its computer that, oh, yesterday there were 13 hours of daylight. So we need, uh, we need three more hours of daylight for this flock tomorrow. So basically it will turn itself on three hours before sunrise. And let's say sunrise is at 6 a.m. It'll turn itself on at 3 a.m. It'll gradually come on like a sunset, sunrise would. It'll keep them lit up until the sun itself does rise and then it will gradually turn off. So now you've got 16 hours of light for your birds. Um, so it's a really like soft way to add light without like just turning on an incandescent bulb and leaving that on all night, right? Like that's harsh and might be a little, little challenging for the health of the bird. Um, so I really love this product. Um, they keep, it's new, it's fairly new. And so they're doing a lot of changes in the product now. Um, I've participated in some studies with the company on, on making the product better. Um, so it's really interesting. Um, and I saw like literally this, this production flock of 50 birds, I was getting maybe a 10% lay rate in the dead of winter last year. So I was getting, you know, you know, not very many eggs uh, for 50 birds. I added this light and it took about a week or two for them to, to gear up. And my lay rate went up to 75% with this light. So it was pretty fantastic and well worth the investment. They also have on their website an, um, an ROI calculator, return on investment. So you can actually calculate like how long it's gonna take you to pay for uh, the system um, with your, your sales of eggs, for example. Um, so anyway, that, that's great. There's also just really, you know, a backyard model where you can just put a light bulb in there. You can have a light bulb on a timer um, and you can have it, you know, set on at, at 5 p.m. and turn off at 9 p.m. So you're adding a little light at the end of the day for them. So that's an option too. Um, so one other thing I like to mention is, is 
do you refrigerate your farm fresh eggs or not? Because I think this is always an interesting topic. Um, you know, the U.S. is the only country that refrigerates all their eggs, and that's because we have a lot of commercial agriculture, factory eggs, um, you know, that uh, have all been washed. Um, in fact, they wash them in bleach water, which is disgusting. <laughs> um, but what, you know, so the way it works is when, when a hen lays an egg, if you've ever seen it happen, as it's coming out, it's wet. Um, and it's coated in this wet coating, which is called the bloom. The bloom is an antimicrobial and an antibacterial coating that surrounds the porous eggshell. Um, it's, it's mother nature's way of making sure that that egg stays safe, that it's not gonna rot, the bacteria is not gonna get inside the porous shell. Um, so if you collect those eggs from your nesting box and you have not washed them, that bloom is still intact on the egg. You can then leave that egg sitting out on your counter for two weeks and nothing's gonna happen to it. It's not gonna rot, it's safe for you to eat. Generally, that's how we like to eat our eggs. Um, also for baking purposes, if you're a big cake baker, you know that a room temperature egg is, makes for a better cake. So one thing to keep in mind. Um, once you've washed that egg, you have washed the bloom off. Now the, the pores in the eggshell are open and, and, and the egg inside is exposed to bacteria entering through the pores. So at that point, yes, you should refrigerate your eggs. Um, so that's just an interesting little tidbit uh, for people to understand. Um, and let's see, I think that kind of covers some of the egg category uh, discussions I wanted to talk about. I've got a resource page here. Um, I'm not sure how to capture all of this, Jordan, and, and put it in, like if, if we can do a screenshot of that, or if we can just, you know, plug all that stuff into the chat somehow. But this is all my contact information. Um, I literally will take a phone call anytime from anyone directly on my cell and you can just call me up and say hey I saw your class and I have a question my chicken's acting weird what should I do um, you know just reach out to me at any point for any of that these are just some of the websites that I go to regularly um, you know the first four being um, other chicken producers or chicken owners that um, you know really have pretty good operations um, set up and lots of knowledge on their websites lots of articles about health and um, anything you need to know about chickens generally um, from different perspectives like fresheggsdaily.com is more of a natural herbal approach to chicken keeping. Um, there's lots of uh, herbs you can grow in your garden that will benefit your chicken's health. Um, she does things really more naturally. Um, things like, you know, she adds apple cider vinegar to her water to keep the worms at bay, um, you know, uh, garlic cloves to the water for an antibacterial um, boost. If you think it's like a transitional period for your chickens and they might catch something. Um, the chickenchick.com is a little more mainstream Western medicine. Um, and, and if you go on her website, it's a little scary sometimes because you get you get in a rabbit hole and you if you start reading her her injuries and diseases um, articles, you're gonna be convinced that your chickens are dying of a hundred different things. So I just caution you on that one. Um, yeah, and then there's a couple of the two bottom ones are, are my two favorite hatcheries. McMurray Hatchery, which I think is in Iowa. Um, they have amazing telephone customer service that will talk you through anything. Um, they have great selection of birds. I've, I've really enjoyed ordering from them. MyPetChicken.com is a, more of a specialty hatchery. It's out on the East Coast. So the chickens would have to travel a little further, which is uh, kind of worrisome sometimes, but they have maybe, uh, and they have an interesting selection of breeds and also some good resources on their website for caring for chickens. Um, yeah, so that's kind of um, the end of like how to do chickens, how to take care of chickens, how to set up chickens. Um, you know, ask if there's any other questions about that, I'm happy to, to touch on it. Um, I can also get into some of the, the details about, um, you know, the production side of things. And, and I am here in my egg washing station, so I can just do like a, a quick little tour of that. So I'm gonna stop my screen sharing here if I can figure out how to do that. And we'll go back to uh, the setup here and I'll kind of just give you a tour of what I have here. I used to wash my eggs in my kitchen sink and have everything going on in my dining room and my kitchen. And, you know, it drove my family crazy um, uh, and I was always in the way. So finally, um, you know, I grew big enough that we could we can invest in, in something out here. And, and we basically just took a corner of our garage that wasn't being used. Um, we, we had it plumbed for hot and cold water. And our, you know, our laundry room is right on the other side of this wall, so it was pretty easy. Um, I found a commercial sink, a, a two-bay sink on Marketplace that I bought used in Minnesota. 
from, um, from a restaurant. Um, I bought this commercial egg washer. Um, commercial egg washers are kind of hard to come by for my size operation. Um, they do sell like a, a really small um, in sink um, egg washer um, that is kind of maybe useful for even a backyard setup. Um, it washes uh, three eggs at a time on a little motorized bristle um, operation. I think that runs maybe around $150 or something like that. I can't remember exactly. I've been through two of those already because the motor burns out. Um, I think they've improved that now and the motor's a little stronger, but um, you know, when I was first starting out. So then I upgraded to like basically, which is the next level up, which is um, the Gibson Ridge egg washer from Gibson Ridge Farm in Ohio. And they're really the only, only company in the country that makes this size egg washer for my size operation. Um, so if there's anybody out there who wants to get into production and manufacture of, of egg washers for, for a small scale um, business, you know, these guys could use some competition probably. Um, but this is a great setup. I've had it now for almost a year. Um, it's definitely not cheap. Um, I want to say it might have been $1,500 um, for this little guy, which is crazy. But the next step up from this is a $5,000 commercial egg washer, which is really for a large scale, a much larger scale operation. Um, so this is super cool. You basically um, take a bucket um, of warm water, you let your eggs soak in fairly warm water um, for you know five minutes just to kind of loosen any debris on the egg. Um, and, uh, and you can put egg washer, they do sell an egg washer product um, that you can add to your water to, to just kind of give it a little extra um, en enzymatic cleaning essentially. Um, and then, um, I mean, I'll turn it on, but it is pretty loud. Um, let's see, do I have an egg? I can even run an egg through there and show you how it works. Um, sorry about that. Okay, so uh, you can turn it on, you know, if you have I do a whole candling system as well, which I have to do inside because it has to be done in a dark room. Um, and I can tell you a little bit about the candling. So this is an egg candler here. It's basically a flash, a glorified, glorified flashlight that plugs in. Um, I have a larger, more commercial one inside that I use, but this is good for just the backyard uh, person. And it lets you see what's inside of your egg. So this is also good if you're gonna hatch eggs. And you want to watch the development of the embryo. Um, so you, you have to be in a dark room. You turn it on, you put your egg um, on the light, and it, it basically lights up the entire inside of the egg, um, which is fascinating to see. And if it's not, um, you know, we should also maybe touch on fertilization. Um, so because I have roosters, obviously a lot of my eggs are probably going to be fertilized. Um, I still sell these eggs, and we still eat these eggs, and there's no problem with that. So you know, sometimes there's a myth that you can't have roosters and eat those eggs, but that is not true. Um, you can. And uh, so, um, so anyway, so the way to tell that an egg is fertilized is if you were to crack this egg open, you would look on the yolk. And on the yolk is going to be a really small white dot, smaller than the pencil, uh, the, than an eraser on a pencil. That little white dot is all the DNA from the hen for making a baby, right? For making a baby chip. Now, if it's been fertilized and the male DNA has been added, that little white dot is gonna have a little white bullseye right in the center. It's fascinating. So, you know, and the eggs you buy from the grocery store, I'm sure are unfertilized, right? Because those hens have never seen a rooster before. Um, uh, never had access to that. So, um, but my eggs, it's fun. You know, as I crack one open, I just like to check and see if it's fertilized or not. It doesn't make any difference to the taste or the safety of eating it. 
um, it's just interesting. It's just also interesting to keep track of how viral my roosters are and how they're doing, if they're doing their job or not. Um, now, this for, if it is fertilized, the only way an embryo is gonna develop is if it's heated up. So you either need to incubate this in an incubator or a hen has to be sitting on it to heat it up. So, um, you know, if I have a hen who's sitting on a clutch of eggs, I'm obviously not gonna collect those eggs or eat those eggs because you're starting the development of an embryo. Um, so you can then see that in your egg. So when I candle all my eggs, there's a couple of reasons I candle them. First of all, I have to for my license for selling eggs. Um, and I wanna make sure the eggs you're getting are good quality and that they're safe, obviously. So I'm gonna look, uh, I'm gonna see hairline cracks. A crack that I don't see, you know, just by with the naked eye, when I candle it, it's gonna light up. And I'm gonna know that egg has been cracked and it's obviously not safe for you to eat. And I do. All my cracked eggs actually go to a local pig farmer, so they all get put back into the food system and the, and the pigs eat them, which is fun. Um, so um, yeah, so I'll see hairline cracks. I will see if there's um, any development of any embryo at all, even like two days that it's been incubating. If the very start of any development is happening, it will show up in the candle. So obviously I'm gonna get rid of that egg. Um, I will also see um, a meat spot or a blood spot in the egg. And you may have cracked an egg open before and found a little brown spot kind of by the yolk or a red spot. Um, they're safe to eat, they're not gonna hurt you. What basically has happened in that case is during the process of making the egg, the hen, something happened um, that during the, the, the passing of the egg through the oviduct where she either was spooked by something maybe, um, you know, just a, a blip, right, a fluke, and she sloughed off a little bit of tissue into that yolk. So as the egg was forming, the white was forming, the shell was forming, that little piece of tissue got trapped in there. It won't hurt you, and you, know, you shouldn't be worried if that should happen, but once again, I'm not going to sell those eggs, right? Like, I keep those eggs, I call them house eggs, we eat those here ourselves, <laughs> um, and, uh, and then give them away to the, our friends who are understanding about the natural way of things. <laughs> Um, so anyway, so uh, that's one, another thing I'm looking for in there. Um, and that's and another thing you can also tell from, from the candling is that's how eggs are graded. So when you go to the grocery store and you see, you know, grade double A, grade A, and grade, well, that's all you'll see is double A and A on the shelves. And you want to know what that means. Well, what that means is that it's the age of the egg. So it will tell you how much air and how big the air cell in the egg is. So I'm getting kind of down in the nitty gritty here. Maybe you guys don't care about this stuff, but I find it fascinating. Um, so in the blunt end of the egg, you have a little air pocket. And as the, the porous egg shell gets older and older, more air is pulled in through the porous shell. And that air cell is going to grow bigger and bigger and bigger. And your egg is going to get older and older and older. Um, and you can actually measure the size of your air cell when you're candling. So you, you have this nifty little gauge and you set it on um, top of the egg and it's going to measure the depth of that air cell. This would be a 3 8 inch air cell, which would mean this is a B quality egg. And this is an egg that isn't fit for human consumption, just, you know, cracking it and, and eating it. And so I wouldn't sell you a B quality egg. However, I would eat it myself because there's no harm in it. It's not going to hurt me. It also makes great hard boiled eggs because it boils, it, you know, it peels easier the older the egg is. Um, but that, that's how they grade them. So then you get down to an A quality egg, which is a 3 16th inch, um, um, you know, air cell. And that's definitely something you can sell. And then you've got the double A quality, with, which is a 1 8 inch air cell. And that's obviously even fresher yet and something you can sell. Most of the eggs I sell aren't even on this chart. They have no air cell in them because they're less than seven days old. And an air cell hasn't even formed yet. So that is why, you know, farm fresh eggs, like if you get them right away, it, you know, they're, they're fresh. So let me tell you, there's not gonna be any air in there. You're gonna get all yolk and, and white. Um, so they're, you know, better, of course, <laughs> I'm biased, but um, versus an egg that's, you know, sat on the grocery store shelf and been in transit for, you know, sometimes as long as four weeks before you eat it. So, um, yeah, so that's just something to know about candling. So then, you know, after my eggs leave the washing station um, and they have air dried, we go to the candling station inside, we candle them all. Um, and then we do, you know, get them all packaged up and, and delivered um, on a weekly basis. So yeah, so that's kind of the, the, the tour here. Um, I don't think there's really anything else that I um, haven't touched on. Um, if, Jordan, if you can think of anything or if anyone has any other questions. 
Um, I can't. I, so when you were doing wholesale, you would make weekly deliveries to your restaurants. How does your uh, working with your customers work? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's basically what it is generally is most restaurants I work with, they have a standing order, um, you know, and and when I'm trying to get new business, you know, I I will go just, you know, drop in restaurants, drop in the back door of a kitchen, (laughs) lock in, introduce myself, bring egg samples, ask to talk to the chef, ask to talk to the manager, um, you know, and just really try to like educate them on why it's important to, um, you know, buy their eggs locally, um, you know, what they're getting for the, the, it is an additional cost to them for sure. Um, the egg off the Cisco truck is about 17 cents for the restaurant. My eggs hover around 25 to 30 cents an egg. So it is an increase in price, um, you know, but an egg is an easy kind of um, entry point into building a relationship with a restaurant and with a chef because they're not using a ton of eggs, you know, usually unless they're a breakfast restaurant. And um, so it's not going to cost them a ton of money to, to spend that extra money. Um, and, you know, it's fun to, to, to be that sometimes I've been the first person in a, in a, in a kitchen, in a restaurant, you know, the first farmer, so to speak, you know, the first local producer that they've met um, and to kind of introduce them into to how that works. Um, and then, you know, I like to take it from there. And once they get going on the eggs and they realize the value um, in building that relationship with someone local, keeping the money in our state. Um, and then, you know, I, I'm, you know, and I love to introduce them to the Dakota Fresh Food Hub, um, you know, get them going with other producers, um, you know, and, and try to encourage that relationship growth um, for our state. Um, so I find that super rewarding. Um, and we've had a lot of success with that, you know, and working also with the local Dakota Rural Action Chapter here um, in Sioux Falls, Homegrown Sioux Empire. Um, we have a local foods campaign. Part of our local foods campaign is to reach out and build those bridges um, between the producer and the local r- restaurants and institutions. Um, also then educating consumers on where they can go to buy local, which restaurants they should they should um, be, be eating at, um, you know, dropping and giving their money to. Um, yeah, so it's, um, it's super fun. Um, and I also like working directly with the chefs on specific um, items that they're making. I'll have chefs reach out to me and, you know, maybe they're going to make a specialty item and they need a quail egg as a garnish for a steak or something. Um, So I also sell quail eggs um, that I buy from a quail farmer that's local here. Um, You know, I've sold um, a variety of of things. Um, I've connected people with duck egg producers. Um, Yeah, so it's fun to work directly with the with the restaurant on that. uh, and yeah, it's generally it becomes a standing order where a restaurant might be, you know, like the Treasury downtown orders 15 dozen eggs every week for their Sunday brunch. You know, um, Turks and Caicos orders, you know, 20 dozen every week for brunch and for to use during the week. Um, you know, places like Maury's Steakhouse, they might use a little less. So maybe they're only ordering, you know, 10 dozen every two weeks because they're really only using them for some desserts and some sauces. Um, you know, um, so it just, it varies, uh, depending on the restaurant I'm working with. Have those orders picked back up recently or is it stayed pretty low? It's, uh, it's about half of what it was. So 50%, um, have come back online with the restaurants. Um, so it's still, I'm waiting for, you know, for some growth there, hopefully. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's been interesting for, to say the least this whole last year. Um, um, but I, you know, I'm hopeful that we'll, we'll get back going again, hopefully. And, um, and yeah, and so I just, you know, it's just, I, I, it's been actually beneficial in a way that it's caused all of us local producers to have to be flexible and think outside the box and come up with maybe some different ways of marketing and selling our products. So, you know, the growth is, it's definitely caused growth, you know, look at us here doing a virtual conference, like, you know, it's, yeah. it's sad that we're not in person, but this is awesome too, that we can now provide this alongside in person as we go forward in the future. So I think that's great. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So I guess we can, you know, I guess we're going to end early, right? Oh, 20 yeah. minutes. Early. Pretty good. You did great. Yeah. That was All right. Well, information. yeah. Thanks everybody. It's fun. Like I said, I could just keep talking. You know, if we, if we could really go portable, I'd walk you around We'd go look at all the chickens, meet them. <laughs> virtually pet them. <laughs> um, yeah, if you guys could do the coop, uh, the wrap up poll that's being thrown out there right now, I'd appreciate it. And Jordan, thanks so much for, for the moderating and the introduction. Thanks for being here, Stephanie. This yeah. was wonderful. Yeah, and SDSU Tech, thank you for everything you guys did to keep us online and, and 
help us figure this out. So it was great. Everybody here, thanks for being part of the conference. I know it was a, a lot different. This was a learning experience for us all. Um, we are going to send out another longer survey via email. If you guys would mind giving us your feedback, uh, we'd really love to hear it. Uh, thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Awesome. Bye.